Today is March 25th, 2014, and this is episode 95. This program is intended for informational and educational purposes only. Cryptocurrency is a new field of study. Consult your local futurist, lawyer, cartoonist, investment advisor, international accountability coordinator, and ethnobotanist before making any investment decisions for yourself. Welcome to Let's Talk Bitcoin, a twice-weekly show about the ideas, people, and projects building the digital economy and the future of money. This is a long one, so we're going to get right into it. We talk Ethereum. I've never seen something like this blow up the way it has in such a short time. The Toronto Conference. This is in the works, but the plan is to have an art show that's going on during the event where, where actual artwork will be created uh, during the talks when they're going on. And then we'll be having an auction on, on the last day. So. And the Bitcoin Foundation, past and future. It's bound to happen because these things don't happen because of technical failures. They don't happen because of uh, bad actors. They happen because of failures of leadership. And the foundation is is the very definition of a failure of leadership. And therefore, these things will happen to them eventually. Waited to, to say that until after we start recording. Okay, so we're oh, going to go into this. What he does in the privacy of his own home <laughs> is his business. <laughs> so today I'm joined on Let's Talk Bitcoin by Stephanie Murphy. Hello. Andreas M. Antonopoulos. Hey there. And special guest host, Anthony Diorio, who is the executive director of the Bitcoin Alliance of Canada, co-founder of CryptoKid, a founder on the Ethereum project, and many, many others. Full disclosure, Anthony is also an individual sponsor of the Let's Talk Bitcoin show. Anthony, thanks for joining us today on Let's Talk Bitcoin. It's an honor to be on with you guys. Thanks a lot. You have like a million projects. So we've been trying to get you on to talk about the conference uh, up in Toronto. But again, it's just like uh, we're, we're starting to do these guest host things. And I'm really I'm into this idea that we can just make this one long conversation because those really seem to be the episodes that people like the most. Pick a project. What do you want to talk about first? Because I got questions about all of them. The, the, the most recent thing that we launched was the Bitcoin Decentral Accelerate, which is an accelerator program that's run out of, out of Bitcoin Decentral, which is a 5,500 square foot building, four foot building in downtown Toronto. that gets, I think, about 100,000 cars passing every day looking at a big orange Bitcoin sign right at the front. Uh, we house uh, an ATM in there. It's a co-working facility. It's a uh, space for the Bitcoin Alliance of Canada, which is a nonprofit organization here in Canada that I'm involved with. We do a meetup every week that gets between 50 and 100 people every Wednesday in the space. We've got uh, some offices for Ethereum out of there. We have uh, HR, legal counsel, accounting from Ethereum working out of there. Vitalik's uh, place of business is out of there. It's offices for CryptoKit. We've got the studio for CoinTalk. Uh, yeah, a bunch of activity going on there, and uh, it's getting busier every day. Uh, it's, it's, it's really a lively building, and it's, it's really amazing to have these people all together in a space that where our ideas are just flowing. So that's that's the newest thing that we've started in January. We've got the expo that's coming up, uh, and that's going to be at the Metro Toronto Convention Center. And I, all you guys are coming. I'm really excited to have you up there. It's uh, it's it's going to be great. It's going to be a real community event, uh, and it's been a lot of. I am fun so looking here. forward to that, Anthony. It's yeah. going to be awesome. It's I'm mean, you know I, I I I what have I done? Maybe 15 conferences in the last year and a half for Bitcoin, and I've really <laughs> learned a lot from them. And I think it needs that balance. It needs that community balance with the business balance, and that's something that I hope that we can uh, perfect. Bitcoin decentral, right? So Anthony, when was the first time we talked? Like uh, it was on episode maybe five or six, I think, of Let's Talk Bitcoin. Did you and before Bitcoin, you mean last year? Yeah, last year. Last year. It was a real early episode, and you know, at that point. Your project was the Alliance of Canada. That was the thing that, that we were talking about at that point. And since then, I mean, like you're working on like, I can count seven or eight different projects here. So like what, what happened over the course of that year that could put you in a position where now you're starting an incubator and I mean, you're just like the nexus for all this activity everywhere I look. So what happened was uh, with the Alliance, I had sold a Bitcoin business before that when I became executive director of the Alliance. Um, and, and I had nothing, I had no business interest at all. And I was a full-time volunteer doing this executive director position, working with the other directors. We've got right now like over a thousand members of the Alliance up here in Canada. Then things just started coming at me with different business ventures and different ideas. And the first one was CryptoKit. I mean, my, my partner, Steve, who I'd worked with before, just out of the blue one day said, hey, I've been working on a Chrome extension with Bitcoin wallet. And I'm like, that's exactly what's needed. And I knew that that's what's needed. I, I've been dreaming about that for a while. I remember at the conference in New York at Inside Bitcoins last year, the Web3 guy saying, that's what's needed. You need to bring it into the browser. And nobody had done it yet. We were the first to do it. And from there, um, 
started working on that project. We've now got, you know, the instant messaging. We've got a Bitcoin directory built into there. And then things just kind of snowballed. Anthony, the question that I wanted to ask you was, you know, when you got started, did you have a bunch of resources or was this something where you like over time from being involved in the community and acting opportunistically, you kind of levered up? So when I, when I got involved, I was just coming out of uh, selling some properties. That's what I had done previously. I was a, I had a, a, a landlord, I had student properties and in Toronto, I, I felt that there was a, it was going to be a hit hard very soon. I think I thought that the, the prices would, would, were, were way overheated. So I decided to get out fully and just, you know, enjoy the, the six years before that of, 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 of uh, the housing prices going up. And I, that's when I came across Bitcoin. It was a perfect time. I was looking to see, okay, where am I going to start investing some of this money? And I think that's about the time it was around 11 bucks. And that's when I made my first purchase. And I did it as easy as going to the bank and just making a bill payment. And that was my first four in. And about a month later, I started the, the meetup group. And it's kind of snowballed from there. And then with the sale of my first business, uh, that was a full Bitcoin sale. And I did pretty well with that. And that's enabled me to continue on um, doing these types of things and, and funding them. So it was always been the goal for my first company with my partner to say, hey, let's get involved in something. And then we'll, we'll, we'll take that money and do something even more meaningful for the community and, and, and for different projects to really spread this out. So that's how it came about. Huh. Last year, the first article that I wrote, the time that you got in actually at $11, that's just about the time that I wrote this, uh, was this, uh, this article based on a bunch of interviews I did with people who had between a couple hundred and a couple thousand Bitcoin. And the question at that point was, well, Bitcoin's this big Ponzi scheme because all the people who got it early and cheap are just going to sell it later and then the price will go down because no one will want it. And there was all this sort of talk. But I went and I talked to people who actually were in the situation where, if, you know, Bitcoin succeeded, they would find themselves there. All of them were talking about starting incubators or launching startups or I mean, like that was the one commonality in all of the divergent opinions and things that they wanted to do. And so, again, like I've been watching your progress for a long time and it really just feels like, you know, I don't know. I, again, like I'm probably putting some of my own bias onto you here, but but that is what I've kind of looked at you like is, you know, someone who's who's taking the opportunities given and levering up and then using that instead of being like, all right, well, now I'm going to take my cash and do something else. You say, okay, and now I'm going to reinvest it in because it makes more sense to me and it's better just generally speaking. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. It's, it's building up the relationships. I mean, Ethereum is a good example of this. Uh, I've known Metallic for a long time. He was actually the very first to up in Toronto that we did. And boy, he's come a long way in the last year and a half with the, uh, it was it was approaching him when we started doing CryptoKit, saying to him, "Hey, we want you to be involved in our project here. Uh, we'd like to offer you part of our company to to just continue doing what you're doing and help development. We're a partner, and we've got a lot of respect for you." It's the same thing we did with Roger Bear and Eric Borges to bring them on board. It was like, you know, I really love what you guys are doing. I look up to you guys a lot, and I'd love for you to be part of this this team with us to get this what we think is a really amazing wallet system out there and continue to improve it. So it's building up those types of relationships that always seem to come back afterwards, and, and that's how I think the brought me in on board with Ethereum. I was one of the initial people with him, and then I brought on, I think it was my connections with Charles Hoskinson and Joseph Lubin, two of the other founders that are involved with us right now. It's about building up those, those connections and, and people just, you know, digging what you're doing and, and giving back to the community. And, and it all comes together, you know, in the, in the nonprofit side of what I do and in the for-profit side I do. And I'm just so passionate about this that I've told you this before, Adam. I'm almost like a three-month guy before I get involved in Bitcoin. I do things for three months and then I'm out. And this has been a year and a half, two years for me. And I'm just more excited every day to be working on this stuff. You know, so Anthony, so the Ethereum project, I think I first read the white paper that Vitalik circulated right before I was getting on a plane to go and talk about DAX in Washington at a retreat that we put on for like five days. And I read it on the plane and I was like, wow. This is really cool. And, and like, I agree with you. I think Vitalik is a really, really interesting guy. He's one of the reasons why I actually got into Bitcoin journalism, ironically, because the publication he was initially involved with had a really innovative, like, we were not going to release the next article until, until uh, enough people pay us a total of, I think they were going for, you know, like half of a Bitcoin back when they were very, very inexpensive or, and, you know, it was, it was small amounts. But the point is, is that like, it was a really innovative model that used this thing. So uh, Vitalik, I totally agree with you that, you know, He's, he's really kind of going down this rabbit hole, but it's an ambitious project. And you guys are trying to do things that 
are hard. And that like, if you look at other projects in the space, they're not as ambitious. And I think that, I mean, do you think that there's a reason there? Do you think that this is like a, like a moonshot type of project or are you guys really feeling like this is accomplishable? I'm, I'm really confident in it just because I, I trust Metallic so much. Uh, I've gotten to know him very well. He's a extremely straightforward, reliable, uh, in my opinion, genius. And I've spoken to other people and our other developers working on the project, and they're very confident in what we're doing to, doing now. So that gives me a lot of confidence. I've never seen something like this grow so quickly. We've got uh, 50, almost 60 Skype groups going right now with hundreds of people involved. And then we've got 25 meetup groups across the world, including one that just had its first in Tehran, in Iran yesterday, the day before. Uh, I've never seen something like this blow up the way it has in such a short time. I mean, we started this in January, like beginning of January. I got involved in the project at the end of December, started this really in January. And what we've been able to accomplish, I think, over the, the, over a few short months, it's been spectacular. The community is really coming behind us. And, and it's, it's this community growth and the excitement that we're seeing, which is leading for people to like to start up meetup groups just because they're, they're, they're so enthusiastic about it. The Are you talking and, about and, uh, meetup groups for Ethereum? We've got over 25 now meetup groups for Ethereum. Okay, wow. Yeah, yeah one popped up in my area recently. It's uh, rather interesting. I'm going to go visit it this week, I hope. Yeah, so we're, we're calling into them on a regular basis. We're just saying, hey, can you come do a Skype call into the group? And, and they're not just, you know, four or five people. There's meetings with like 30, 40 people involved in these things. So um, that's where you can really tell what people are feeling about a project. And it's also the excitement of other guys. I mean, MasterCoin, they're, they're thrilled about what we're doing. Uh, we're going to be doing some work, hopefully, with, you know, collaborations with uh, with open transactions they're one of our partners actually our strategic partners and we've got even companies like avg uh, the antivirus guys that are excited and, and reached out to us and got some ideas for monetization strategies uh, for their virus software program. so it's really touching a lot of different people and, and it's it's really exciting to be involved in this so what was- would go on at a uh, ethereum meetup well in general um a representative or somebody who's reached out to says, hey, I want to start up this meetup. Uh, can you give us some tools? We give them some educational tools. We'll usually have one or two of the leadership team call in, answer questions from the people in the space there, let them know what's going on with the product sale and, and when we, we plan on uh, starting to sell Ether, which, of course, is the currency of, of Ethereum. Um, so it's it's it, it's information that they want to they want to understand better, um, you know, how the project came about, what obstacles we're facing, if if we need people to get involved, we're an open source project on one side of things. So there's lots of opportunities for people to start helping and assisting us. And uh, it's unique. It's, it's, it's an extremely unique situation. And it's, it's being run by, I think, a really well-organized team. And we're just moving really quickly uh, in, a, in a couple months to be able to have this team that we put together, not have an issue with developers. Like we've got a plethora of developers helping us out, which seems to be the common uh, problem in the space right now, especially with the, with the next level of cryptocurrencies. People are just having struggling to get developers on board. We just don't have that issue where people are just flocking to it and, and helping us out. And most of them are volunteers. So now you have not sold any Ether yet. That is something that was originally scheduled for the end of January and has moved a couple of times. Can you share kind of some of the genesis of, of that process? Plan initially was to launch in, in Miami was to, uh, at the time it was going to be called a fundraiser. And we had to take a step back because there was, there was too much money that, that we were, we were being told was going to come into the project. And we had to ensure that we had done things properly in terms of security regulations. Like we, we just had to take a step back, decide which country we we're going to go to actually to be a jurisdiction for Ethereum. And we, we eventually decided to go with Switzerland. Uh, we were, we were immensely helped by the open transaction guys who had already set themselves up there. A lot of good connections. And it looks like right now we're going to be stamped as, as a currency by the Swiss government and also to be able to be sold as a piece of software. We're going to have, not have the tax implications that we initially thought we might be having. It's really forming to be a perfect uh, situation for us. Uh, we're setting up there. We've got the hub in Toronto, the hub in Switzerland, and we've got a bunch of others that seem to be forming right now. We're setting one up probably in San Francisco, in New York, and we're calling them Holons. That's the name for our, our hubs. And I think a Holon is like a, a part of the whole and the whole itself. I think that's a term. I wasn't familiar with it before, but that's what we're calling our hubs in different cities. So we decided to take a step back. Uh, regroup, make sure that we were doing things properly and also come up with plans and strategies for, for where the money is going to be put forth. 
And it, it really was, was the wisest decision we ever made. And we're just taking our time right now. We're, we're probably a couple of weeks away. There will be lots of announcements before we start selling Ether. But uh, we, we really were able to slow down, and uh, I'm glad that we did. So, Anthony, tell me more about the Switzerland thing. I mean, what are the specific advantages of being a company based in Switzerland? Are you saying it's you're going to actually be a company that is based out of Switzerland for the initial crowdfunding with Ethereum? You know, how did you go about that? And do you think Switzerland is going to become like a mecca for Bitcoin businesses now? I think what we have is a great opportunity to lead the way there and actually work with the Swiss government. A lot of interaction in Switzerland is directly with the government. And that's what we've been able to do. And I think we're going to be at a, a we're going to be only able to write certain things uh, because they're using us as a test model. Uh, and, it's, and it's gone amazingly with what they've been able to do for us over there. And the connections with, with, with the lawyers and connections with the OT guys uh, have been able to open the doors for us and really expedite things. If we were to try to do this in some other place, this could, this would have taken months or even maybe a year, a year to get, get all this done. Our main entity is in Switzerland. Uh, we've got some designers out there. We've got some employees out there. Charles Hoskinson has been there for the last many weeks getting things set up. He's also with Mihai, two of our founders. So there are two of our founders there. We've got eight founders in total. Uh, two of them are operating out of Toronto. We've got one from Jamaica. We've got one from Israel. So that's going to be our, our main setup there. And we have to actually keep infrastructure there. As, as It's not like we're just setting up a shell company. That's actually part of it. And that's going to be our main focus there. And then I've got, um, I've got accounting and I've got legal going on out of Toronto. HR's out of there. We've got the video production. We've got uh, some of the security guys. It sounds like, you know, with something like Ethereum, obviously the ultimate goal is to be a DAC, right? Is to be decentralized and not have a centralized company that is um, issuing software or anything like that. But now we're kind of in this awkward in-between phase where we're trying to get to that from where we are now. So what is the plan as far as evolving toward being a, a completely decentralized organization? Yeah, so it, it is definitely our plan, I think, within one or two years to, to take it to that route. That's definitely where we want to go. A large part of what we're doing is going to be going into a nonprofit. We're going to wait to see how many, how much actually comes in before we make that percentage decision as to what's going to be going into a nonprofit and what would be going into the for-profit entity. Um, our plan and what we'd like to do is, is to say as much as possible that we can put into the nonprofit. And that's going to be mean working with uh, universities. Uh, we've got two of the top uh, cryptography people from the University of Waterloo that are that have joined us and, and be working with us. So we want to set up, you know, educational programs. We want to set up, I think that that, that needs some type of structure. And that's where the nonprofit's going to come into play. The for-profit stuff is going to go towards building the apps that are going to be done on top of Ethereum. It's going to go towards funding the accelerator space in Toronto that we're doing. We'll try to set one up in New York as well. And it really was something that we had to do in that sense was we had to also have a portion of it as a, as a for-profit. And I think that's, and I don't know the details too much, but because of the setup that we have in Switzerland, that's what we have to do. So it's going to be our challenge to balance the nonprofit and the for-profit to separate them. But our goal is to have as much going towards the nonprofit and really build up our infrastructure and build up the very low end uh, parts of, of, of Ethereum, which is like the reference client and things like that. And then separate that between the higher level stuff, which are the, the applications and yeah, the more, the more higher level activities that we'll be doing. Are you concerned that working with a university could slow things down at all? Yes, that, that, that's a concern of mine. I think having certain people like Neil Koblitz working for us and some of the people that Vitalik's worked with, it is something that I definitely think about. It might be a little bit more like we're, we're traveling in mud doing that, but I think it'll have to be monitored and we're actually going to be the ones that are going to be you know, on top of that. So you might be right. It might be an issue in that. Uh, I guess we'll just have to see what comes out of it. And it's not going to be all our eggs in one basket going to the university. So I want to know more about Switzerland too. Like what are the specific legal tax, whatever advantages of being in Switzerland for a Bitcoin business? Not that you're really, not that that exactly describes Ethereum, but why Switzerland? You know what? I wasn't involved too much in the decision making that I, I haven't been to Switzerland to figure that out. It's Charles Hoskinson that's, uh, that's oh, organizing gotcha. things out there. So all I know is um, it, it's, it's worked out perfectly in that we don't have any tax events that are going to happen on the sale, yet we can still sell ourselves like we're selling software. And that takes us out of the whole issues of having to deal with SEC or having to deal with securities or having to do IPOs or any type of um, prospectus, things like that. And that, so that's it, why the decision 
is it fair to say that you that you had lots and lots of options and pick the one that you felt like and apparently have gotten the best deal for what you're trying to do? Yeah, I, I'd say that we, we searched it and that seemed to be the best place. And then with the connections and the people that we had who had gone through that before, it, it was a perfect fit. So uh, there's an area of the Ethereum project that I've been highly critical of, and it's that the founders have a special rule set that was designed for them and that only apply to them and not to anybody else. And I know that uh, I've brought this up in the past, and I know you guys have kind of changed it a couple of times. And so do you have any thoughts on that? You know, can you can you share the genesis of why uh, why it's why it makes sense for uh, for an Ethereum founder to get you know, like a special rule set just for them when other people starting other types of currencies aren't doing that sort of thing? The rule set is that it's not just the founders. It's actually the whole team of people that have been working on this since December that are going to be getting a certain percentage. And it's still getting worked out. What we've seen from the community, though, is, and we, we, have, we think we have a good pulse on the community, is that it doesn't seem to be the things that people are, are, are concerned about. And I think we, we're doing it in a way that it will be very small, we're doing it in a way that uh, we think people have to get rewarded. We're taking on positions here. We're taking on risks here. We're not creating something and then leaving this project. And it's going to be something that we're going to be guiding it through for the next year to two years. Um, it's, 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 I've had to now take a focus away from some of the things that I'm working on to be working on this more full time. Uh, and, and that it's being split between 50, 60 people that have been working um, on the project and haven't had any uh, any payment as of yet. We're completely self-funded and bootstrapped at the point right now. And it's not as been cheap doing all this stuff with all the setups uh, in Switzerland and in Canada here. So I think we're being fair with what we're doing. We still haven't officially um, decided exactly what percentages that, that, that will be, um, that will be done. But you know what? I, I think it's fair. I think the team thinks it's fair. And it seems like from the voice of the community that they're more excited about what we're trying to accomplish here than, than thinking about that. Yeah, I have a lot I mean, less one problem the, with it now compared to when I did when we were talking about a launch at the end of January when there hadn't been a lot of work done to that point. It was mostly a paper still. Yeah, I think there's a valid argument to be made. The, the bottom line is this is open source software. So, you know, if you really like the idea and the concept and the source code and the work that's being done, but you don't like the team's approach to fundraising, you could always clone and create Lightherium, uh, build an alternative team around Lightherium, which is silver contracts to Ethereum's gold contract. <laughs> and then uh, you could uh, try and create an alt contract and uh, see if you can compete in the market. And if people think that's a better way to IPO it, they'll reward that. And if people think that the original team that has, you know, people like Vitalik in it is better suited to solve this problem and continue to maintain it, they'll back that. I mean, that you know, I understand some people's concern, but... At the same time, I've heard so much hyperbole around this that just because, um, you know, you're using the coin to fundraise for the team that's developing the coin, somehow that's a scam. And I think that's ridiculous because, uh, you know, I've used the source code. I can go in there and create a clone of Ethereum in about 10 seconds. There's already like three implementations of it in three different languages and launch my own. So if anybody thinks they can do it better, they have that opportunity. It's not a closed source system it's you have a choice here that impacts substantially though people who have invested in it and there are two actually arguments to be made here the first is that is it a competitive disadvantage to have special rules for certain groups and again like i said when i was you know having more of a problem with this it was going to be five people and they were people who you know again like i i like all you guys it's not about that i don't want you to get paid it's just that in a world that is open source and the only competition that can beat you is the competition that takes your finished product, forks it, and then gives it away for a tenth of the price of what you've done, it seems like that would matter to people who are buying Ether as a product. I think what we got to focus on here is, is, the, is the team that we've got behind it as well as the strategic partnerships that we're building. I honestly am, am, am not concerned about, about someone else being able to, to bring together this type of, of, uh, of community and this type of team that we've been able to, to do it. And we've been able to, to attract a lot of developers, a lot of people who are realizing that they're going to be rewarded for what they're doing. You guys have done um, a fantastic it, job. I really don't mean to diminish that at all. As far as the projects that are out there, as far as community building, investing stakeholders and may like, and you guys haven't even, there's not even a token yet. And the community for sure. I mean, like Ethereum is a project that has a ton of buzz and a ton of very good thoughts about it in the community, contrasting with a lot of the other projects. 
it's a balance, Adam, and it's been a balance that we've been working with the community sure. and changing. And uh, we are, I think we're people that we're, we're going to feel confident going in and you're not going to appease everybody. I've always used whatever I've done in the Bitcoin space as a 90%. I try to do everything, whether it be what I did with the Alliance, what I do is I want 90% plus to approve. If you can't get that type of approval, you're going to be fighting uphill. And I think we've got that. And I think we've got the, the encouragement from the community. So you're going to get people that, that, that are on board, but we'll do the best we can to be fair. And I think that's what we're going to do. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to continue to press you on this, Anthony, just on a slightly different angle. The other argument against doing something like this is that you essentially, again, it depends on how large this is. So I could be, you know, completely out of line here, but the other concern is that you create a situation where the people who are working on the project have a situation where win or lose, you know, with the project, they're good because they got all this money up front that they could use as money during this exciting period. They're just, I think that that's the, anyways, I'm sorry. I am a squeaky wheel. That is the definition of what I am. And I really do try to bring that to every project that I involve myself with because I complain about a lot of these things before other people do. But, but I appreciate you doing that. And it's, it's you doing that. That's going to make us be better and make us, if we can appeal to, to someone like yourself, and, and we've already said you've already feel better, a lot better on the way things have gone over the last few months. And that's great. I, I encourage that. And I think the whole team encourages talks like this. You know, Adam, I was wondering, like, is your issue with the different set of rules for certain people or is it with the idea that certain people are getting paid? Because it sounds like you're saying your issue is with the, the fact that it's built into the code that there are different rules for some individuals. Yes. At the core of my issue here, it's that I feel like any time you set up special rule systems for whoever and whatever the intention is, it just muddies the water. It just makes it so that now it's a, now it's not a simple situation. But I'm doing the same thing with LTB coin. With LTB coin, you know, we're, we're figuring out how we're going to vest people initially in it. And that's probably going to look a lot like what Ethereum is doing here. So I, I have all these same problems and I have all these same concerns because ultimately, you know, Anthony, you're one of eight founders, you know, and the team that's going to be getting the distribution is like 50, but there are a lot of you making this decision. Whereas with our project, a lot of these uh, kind of core decisions, like I'm trying to outsource as much as possible, but I have to make a lot of these decisions myself. So it, I'm, I'm very conscious of the of the optics issues and really trying to figure out what the best path forward is because everybody's trying something different and I can't figure out which one's right. You know, you guys have been really successful at building investing stakes. And I think the Holland idea is fantastic. I mean, like, again, just the fact that you guys are showing up on conference calls and like doing the outreach stuff is more than, you know, like nobody else is doing that. That That is the most important thing here. So again, like I just feel like it would be such a shoo-in if it wasn't for this one level of added complexity that makes it so I have to worry about that part. But again, like I said, I'm a squeaky wheel. I understand where you're coming from. And we it, it had a lot of debates and a lot of discussions. When you got eight people on the leadership team, you're going to have both sides of it. And we're at a comfortable point, actually. I think the most comfortable we've ever been as, as the eight. Because you have some people on one side of the far street and other people on the other. And we've been able to come in the middle to the point where everybody seems to be happy. So I think, I think we're pretty comfortable. This is Chris Joseph bringing you news on Next, the first true second generation cryptocurrency for March 25th, 2014. If you've been into the Bitcoin talk forums lately, you may have noticed that the Next thread is now more than 2,500 pages long. The Next community uses this thread to discuss everything from Next core features to philosophy to the true identity of BC Next. It's a thriving discussion, but it's a little hard to follow if you're only interested in one topic. New forums dedicated to Next have been set up at nextforum.org. It looks and feels a little bit like the Bitcoin Talk Forum, that's intentional, but there are now separate topics there for Next features, applications, marketing, tech support, and more. Check it all out at nextforum.org. For more general information on Next, head to nextcrypto.org or mynxt.org. And stay tuned for more news on Next on the next Let's Talk Bitcoin broadcast. The last uh, week or so, maybe a bit more than a week, I've been uh, playing around with the proof of concept test blockchain on Ethereum. I've been mining Ethereum. I have more than 4,000 Ether right now, woohoo, which I mined <laughs> on, my, uh, on my laptop. And it's, by the way, it's test, testnet Ether, so it's worth nothing. 
it allows me to uh, build contracts and uh, fund those contracts and send payments back and forth and then try out the code. So I'm currently playing with the um, high level language, which is uh, C like I played a bit with a Lisp one, but I'm, I'm not a huge fan of, of Lisp. I know that's a heretical to say uh, among programmers, but um, I prefer procedural languages for for things like this. I've been playing around with it and building a few contracts and doing fancy things and really enjoying it so far. I think it's uh, it's definitely been a very interesting learning experience because it's it's just so radically different than everything else we've seen before. You know, every other blockchain technology we've seen before is pretty much a clone of Bitcoin and single focused. I found it very, very interesting. How's progress going towards a final release? Do you, do you see uh, incremental releases going on for a while up to the point where you get the final release in uh, Q4? Yeah, that, that's the plan. And that, that's also another reason why we didn't uh, launch, uh, what was it, a month, month and a half ago, was because we thought it would be a great idea to actually have something that someone can actually try and have have a proof of concept out there that people could toy around with and see that we actually have something tangible and, and, and then take it to market. So we're looking at, uh, I still think, Q3 or Q4, but until, until then, I believe there will be incremental releases. Sounds good. I'm looking forward to continuing to work on Ethereum and and basically learning learning from it. I I think as with the blockchain coins, I think you're going to eventually have some alts pop up in that space too, which is probably a really good thing for competition and and feature picking and testing as it has been in the in the altcoin space. We've learned a lot from alts against Bitcoin, but we we certainly will learn even more with Ethereum. Do do you find that a uh, a promising potential? Do you find that a scary potential? How, how do you feel about alt Ethereum's? I think it's great. <laughs> yeah, bring it on. I mean, whatever is good. We're, we're planning. A lot of people are excited to get their their coins put onto Ethereum, and I've got no concerns about uh, other ones coming out. Or you know, if there is a competition, that's fine. It's gonna you know, just like just like Bitcoin. I'm I'm great with it. I'm I think Ethereum is amazing. I think if something else comes along, that's great. It's just going to be pushing us forward in, in, in like overall and that's that's all I really care about. Yeah, I would I would consider it the best form of uh, flattery to have someone validate the idea that we need a contract platform by building another one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And and for us it's about getting getting more and more people into it to we we initially had started with the with the product sale that we were going to be uh, capping it at a certain amount. We've since decided we're not going to do that because we want as many people to be able to purchase ether at the beginning as possible. I mean, what would happen if a couple of big fish would go in there and just buy everything right up at the beginning? So we've left the after the model of, of the product sale being uncapped. We just want everybody to be involved, everybody to have a piece in it, because that's, that's actually where the, the community grows once you have skin in the game. I'm interested in uh, many of the applications in Ethereum that are simply not possible with existing coins. I think um, many of the examples we see in the early examples for Ethereum are things that are possible with other coins. So they're currency focused or they're escrow focused or there are simple contracts that could really just be a, an altcoin is, instead. But yeah, I'm most interested in the things that you simply can't do with uh, with a coin, that you need a contract language to do. Things like doing um, title and deed registry for real estate transactions or uh, will and estate planning beyond the simple multi-sig and escrow capabilities. Those are things that are simply radical enough that they can't be done with existing platforms. And I think that's where you start seeing uh, the power of having uh, this approach to uh, contracts. Yeah, I, no, I completely agree. I, it, it's going to open the doors to to a lot of things, and and you know we're confident we're going to be able to take it there. We've been talking about this for a while. This this kind of plan for if you were going to do a conference, what would you do differently? What would you do right? You are doing an enormous conference. The event itself is the 11th through 13th of April. It's at the Metro Toronto Convention Center, which is Canada's largest conference center. And we've got two tracks that will be going. We can fit about 500 in each room. Plus, we have a, an expo hall, which can fit about 1,000 people. And we've even got 30 or 40 booths in there. Uh, and then we've got a fireside chat room, which is going to be a more intimate setting. And I hope that, Adam, you want to be involved with that. And Kyle from Coin Talk to be interviewing people on a, a much more personal nature. And we've got the banquet dinner on the Friday we really want this to be a community feel. We've had some that are that are more business oriented with the conferences and we want it to be a good mix. It's being put on by the community up here in Canada. It's complete 100% volunteer basis and any funding that, that we do or any money that we do 
happen to make, if there is anything, we'll go back to the alliance here. But it's been a, it's been something that's been an easy sell for the speakers. I think we got over 50 that are coming, people from different communities. I, I'm really hoping that we can get the speakers all together to get that good community feel that I felt in Argentina, which was, uh, I'm not sure if you concur, Andreas, but my favorite conference so far in terms of the, the community that was involved in that. Yeah, without so, a doubt. Yeah, that's really the type of feeling I want to have with this. And I had an excellent time in Austin. I mean, it, it was it was a lot of a lot of fun. A lot of the same speakers will, will be in Toronto that were there. I had a wonderful time. I think uh, what I like about our venue is that it's going to be a much tighter venue, not in terms of space, but in terms of proximity to the to the talks. And I think everybody will have more chance to run into each other, which was one thing that I felt a little bit awkward with in, in Austin was just the way that the rooms were separated. And I didn't get a chance to meet some people that I knew were there, but I just couldn't find them a lot of the time. So this, I hope, is going to have a nice, a nice smaller feel to it. But I had an excellent time in Austin, though. Yeah, Anthony, I saw you once, which I was kind of surprised at. I know we were both there. I stayed so with that's... Andreas. Andreas, I think I saw you once right at the beginning of your first talk, and then that was it. Yeah, so. and I was actually looking for you. I wanted to talk um, a bit more about things, and it, it was impossible. It was uh, spread out, but also very busy. But at the same time, I think it was a great conference. I really enjoyed it. It was up there with Argentina as one of my favorite uh, conferences of the last 12 months. And I, I can tell you, I'm really looking forward to Toronto. So Bitcoin's yeah, big, but it's not that big yet. Yeah, and I'm hoping that we can, can deliver on the uh, – we got Inside Bitcoins. It's literally, I think, two days before our event. And, uh, but I think we got a great cast of speakers. I'm, you know, I encourage you guys to come a day early and we can spend some time together just in a, a more intimate setting than, than we think we've ever been able to do. So yeah, I, I'm really, really excited about it. I'm coming early and staying late. <laughs> yeah, same here. <laughs> All right. Uh, Anthony, one of the things that we had talked about last time that I was curious if it managed to happen, you were talking about doing either like a reduced cost, um, uh, like part of the conference where new users could come in. Did that ever manage to materialize? Yeah, we're actually doing that. So we've got a free aspect. Everything that we do with the Alliance has a free aspect to it, whether it be our membership, uh, whether it be a conference that we put on. So on both days, we've, we've had to add a second day just because of the amount of people that were coming. We've had, I think, three to 400 people register for the free sessions, which is in the morning on the Saturday and now on the Sunday where you can come and learn about Bitcoin. I think it's going to be something similar to what you did, Stephanie, in Austin. And in fact, I want to talk to you about perhaps doing the same thing up in Toronto. And I'm game it's going for to be it. About Oh, awesome. It's going to be about getting, you know, getting your first wallet, having experts that can answer questions, and then they'll be able to go through the expo hall. Uh, but yeah, we, we are doing that, that free session. We've got different levels of tickets for the events. I think our, our base price for the tickets is $200, which gives you access to the, the two main speaking rooms in the expo hall for the, for the Saturday and Sunday. And then we have uh, the, dinner, the dinner, which I think is $275. So it's $75 on top of the, the initial price. And then there's the VIP package, which is access to the VIP events, including the fireside chat area and the speaker's dinner, speaker's banquet dinner on, on the Friday night. So is there going to be anything to showcase um, all the great community spaces like Bitcoin Decentral? Is there going to be like a tour or anything or after parties there to show off what's been going on locally? Yeah, definitely. There's also going to be a hackathon. We're going to be running that out of Bitcoin Decentral because it's mm -hmm. a... It's about a 10 minute walk between Bitcoin Decentral and the conference center. So it's everything's nice and tight there. We'll also be doing, uh, there will be some, some uh, sponsored event parties on, on the Saturday night. On uh, the Friday with the dinner, we'll probably be doing something in the afternoon at Bitcoin Decentral. So that's why I would like you guys to get there early and we'll be doing cocktails and stuff and then walk over to the, to the conference center. And then on Sunday, we'll be doing, we're still, this is in the works, but the plan is to have an, an art show that's going on during the event. Where, where actual artwork will be created uh, during the talks when they're going on. And then we'll be having an auction on, on the last day, something That's similar awesome. to what they had yeah, with the auction in, in Argentina. So, and then any artwork that that's left over, we'll be hanging it on Bitcoin Decentral and people coming to the meetups will have a chance to buy it, but it'll all be Bitcoin themed work. So it's, it's about doing these little different things. And, and I hope that we're going to accomplish that. I really like what we're seeing right now, which is uh, conferences started up by the community, uh, focused on the community needs and focused on building stronger community by getting people to network rather than, you know, focus on raising money or discussing the uh, return on investment uh, based on capital allocation by venture capital firms, unless the regulators step in. Oh, my God, I'm already falling asleep just talking about it. And, <laughs> and you know, these conferences are so much more fun and so much more interesting. You get to talk about the cool technology, you get to meet the programmers, you get to meet the people who 
are building new and exciting innovation. And if you're lucky, you don't get to meet any of the uh, investor class. So it's it's really great. <laughs> it's about balance, Andreas. You got to have both in these things. And and for me, I the more the community part of this is the better. And I think that's what we're going to be attracting. Yeah, well, we didn't have much balance in some of the recent uh, conferences, and I found that very, very boring. I, I, I'm not worried because uh, if you have a vibrant community event, um, the investor class will show up. <laughs> if nothing else, just to mooch off the, uh, off the innovation. But uh, you, you, you can't do. You can have an event where only the investor class shows up and the community stays at home, and that's that's a terrible event to have. So I'm really glad that we're seeing. Uh, this uh, the spirit of the community being shown in these events and and getting a much more vibrant event as a result. It's been my goal since day one to do that, and that's what I've been. That's one of the reasons I even travel to go to conferences to really see how we can do things uh, and, and make a spectacular event for the community. All the ones I've been to so far have had good things about them and worse things about them, and uh, sometimes the balance tips more toward the good and sometimes more towards the worst. But you can learn from all of them and make a better event. is the world's first Chrome browser Bitcoin wallet. It's the easiest, fastest Bitcoin wallet payment system. With a simple one-click install, it takes just seconds to get your wallet set up. And because CryptoKit finds the address and payment for you, there's no more fussing around or tab switching. CryptoKit is more than just a wallet. It comes with a preloaded PGP encrypted social network, news feeds from Reddit and Google, and up-to-date charts from exchanges. Finally, CryptoKit directory allows you to make two-click payments with any of the BitPay merchants. Once you install CryptoKit, you won't need anything else. For for more information or to download CryptoKit, visit CryptoKit.com. The BitGive Foundation is a nonprofit charitable giving organization leveraging the power of the Bitcoin community to improve public health and the environment worldwide. Help us demonstrate the significant impact of Bitcoin in addressing these critical issues on a global scale. Support international giving in Bitcoin. Please visit our website at www.bitgivefoundation.org. That's www.bitgivefoundation.org. So, Anthony, recently the Bitcoin Foundation has been in the news and the news hasn't been so great. And it's kind of been interesting because it's not really the foundation so much as some of the core members of the foundation who have been finding themselves in hot water. Your earliest project was uh, and continues to be the uh, Bitcoin Alliance of Canada. You know, we've talked about, you know, some of the problems with the foundation before. I'm curious, you know, do you have any thoughts or comments on kind of what's going on there now? I, I think it is, you know, um, when you're involved in, in a... Uh, an organization like that is re that is representing something that is is this disruptive technology. Uh, anytime someone that's in, that's involved in that is having issues, it's definitely you know not a good thing for Bitcoin. And I, you know, I sometimes I don't want my phone to ring because it tends tends to be uh, the press calling and telling me something that I hadn't known yet, and they want to take half my day now to start talking about that. Um, but you know. We got to move forward from that. I think there's great people coming into the foundation. I'm always eager to work with them. I think they've just announced in Canada that they've got their interim board of directors. Uh, I think they're working closely with the Montreal embassy. So, you know, I hope to, to have more discussions with them. There are people that are doing an amazing job with the foundation and, you know, we'll get some more people in there. And I, th I think it's going to be just fine. So you think that over the long term, the Bitcoin foundation, once they, you know, restaff up and recover is going to be a relevant organization moving forward? I do. I don't. I don't think they're they're going to disappear, and I I think they probably made some moves recently because of what's happened. That is going to strengthen what what they're trying to do, and and I hope they succeed. I mean, the better that they can do, the better we're all going to do. And I'm a member of the foundation, and you know I want them to succeed. I want to see more good press coming out to it, and this will hopefully push them push them more to to, to get it where they want it to be. 
Well, so where they want to be is an interesting question. You know, one of the points of contention about the Bitcoin Foundation has been what kind of an organization are they? Because I also am a member, but that hasn't really mattered too much about being able to understand what the Bitcoin Foundation really is. There, there isn't much more clarity when you're a member than when you're not. Specifically, uh, the Bitcoin Foundation could be a trade organization where they represent industry and then they're only representing the industry members who are choosing to be members of them. That's, that's a pretty standard type of organization. But there's kind of this broad perception in the community that's been around just forever. I don't know if anybody's even encouraged it, that the Bitcoin Foundation represents the Bitcoin community. And the Bitcoin Foundation has never really come out and explicitly said, like their website doesn't say, we do not, we are not the voice of the Bitcoin community. You know, it doesn't say that. So I, I'm asking both, what do you think the Bitcoin Foundation wants to be? Uh, and also, what do you consider the Bitcoin Alliance of Canada relative to those two options? I think from day one, the foundation has wanted to represent Bitcoin. I think that was their goal. They were accepting memberships from around the world. So to me, that that is that they, they wanted to represent Bitcoin um, and they wanted to do it internationally. And I think that's fine, but I think they had made some mistakes initially that has led to an imbalance and, and people that felt that they weren't included in, in a lot of things. So, and, and from that, we've got great leaders that have gotten together with some other organizations and formed the Global Bitcoin Alliance, which is just launched uh, in, in Germany last month. So it's actually a great thing that that's come out of um, the affiliate plan and structure of the foundation is that national organizations have come together and we want to just share resources, share, you know, the best practices, share the models that we've done and gone through and help facilitate and speed the growth of communities worldwide. So um, I think the foundation has wanted to be represent Bitcoin from the start. I think they made some mistakes initially. I think it can still be fixed. And I think they can work with national organizations, too. We can all just work together with a common goal. Now, you mentioned that uh, we can work with national organizations, but I just heard you mention a international organization, it sounded like, farming out of Germany that I actually have not heard anything about. Is You said this happened last week? No, it happened actually last last month at the, the event in, I think it was in Berlin. Ah, huh, interesting. Um, yeah, and, and uh, the Global Bitcoin Alliance came about from national organization leaders such as myself meeting at conferences and we, we, we want to set up a very loosely knit organization that is just sharing resources. There's no contracts between each other. There's no, you know, anybody can be part of this. You can be a meetup group. We're just going to be a resource for events. We'll be a resource for uh, best practices. Actually at the, at the expo in Toronto, there's going to be some tracks for the global Bitcoin Alliance um, that, that, that'll guide people how to set up communities. Cause this is what we've done. And we don't want people to have to reinvent the wheel. We want it to be nice and easy, but we don't need to have a tie to each other with any type of contract. We can just say, hey, we're going to be open with each other. We'll be transparent. We'll share. We'll be, we'll be inclusive of anybody that wants to be there. You don't need one organization from one country. It's better to have multiple organizations. Let's get everybody involved. So we're very loose. We only basically communicate when we're just sharing, you know, hey, what happened to you guys? last week or do you find a better process to do with a meetup group and we're going to develop processes and best practices to form communities around the world that's our focus so i don't see ourselves as a lot as a lobby group or anything like that we're just a group that's going to help form larger bitcoin communities so is it safe to describe this as a international alliance of national alliances i call it a collaboration of independent groups Okay, I like that. So um, can you contrast that to the model that the Bitcoin Foundation is approaching other, you know, because they're trying to become an international organization? Yeah, I'm, I'm one of the founders of, of the, the Global Bitcoin Alliance with, with teams from Argentina, from Israel, and, and a bunch of other countries that, that came together and thought that, that something like this should be started. And it, it came about actually with the foundation trying to set up these contractual agreements with, with national organizations that are out there. And we didn't think that that was the best way to go about things. So through some discussions, we, we thought of, of a better approach, which, which we like, which is to, to be very, very loose and not needing any of these type of documents and just sharing resources and best practices. That's what this came about. So I am involved with it. Um, it's, it's not going to have the, the, I don't think, the effect of the foundation in terms of, of, of scale. We're just here to know that, that we're partnering, that we all agree that, that just for the better interest of building these communities of Bitcoin, let's work together, let's collaborate, yet we need as many points of separation as possible. Yeah, I think that's really important to, because what you're doing effectively is decentralizing so, something like the Bitcoin Foundation, um, whereas they are a pretty centralized organization uh, and 
sometimes are even sort of misunderstood by the public as representing Bitcoin. I don't think you would uh, claim to be about that at all. This is just a networking thing where anybody is welcome to join and we'll see what comes out of it. And I think that's so important because a lot of the best projects and uh, opportunities come out of those networking opportunities. So kudos to you for that. Well, and also I want to I want to make sure we're clear too. the foundation. If it wasn't for the foundation, I would not have been probably building the communities that I'm doing. I've learned from what they've done. They were first to market. And of course, maybe, you know, maybe they made some mistakes and that's fine. But they've done a great service to me. And I've, I've learned to be more you know, open with the models that we're doing. And I really have a lot of respect for the people that are working there right now. And I do communicate with, with many of them there. So I think they've learned as well. And through communications and, and the outreach to these different national organizations who said, you know, perhaps the way you guys are going about these affiliate programs isn't right or or it can be done a little bit differently. I think they've learned from that and they're willing to adapt as well. So I've seen changes. I'm really happy that they that they exist. I, I really am. I think they have done a lot of great things for, for the community. I think that they helped me to get where I want to be. So I, and, I, and I look forward to working with them in the future. And, you know, I am optimistic of the foundation. I see the foundation as, as two things, two distinct things. One kind of is a professional association which can coordinate some responses to public policy issues, talk to people and, you know, without any authority really, but just just act as a source of information. And then there is the leadership team. And I think on the leadership team, there are some serious, serious problems, conflicts of interests and some very big issues that need to be fixed. But I do see at the same time, there are a lot of uh, very, very talented people involved at different levels within the foundation doing work within various working groups, whether that's um, in the foundation's education committee, whether that's in coordinating speakers for conferences, not Bitcoin conferences necessarily, but making sure that uh, conferences are attended by qualified speakers and providing a contact point for conference organizers who don't necessarily know how to navigate the community very well. You know, all of those uh, functions. Recently, I agreed to join the foundation's uh, working group on dealing with poverty issues through Bitcoin. We don't have a name for the committee yet. Um, various names have been suggested, but it's basically focused on financial inclusion, economic development, measures against poverty, dealing with issues such as remittances and micro lending. I'd like to call it the Committee for the Other Six Billion, which has been a passion of mine since the beginning in Bitcoin, something I talked about a lot. I joined that working group as the, as the chairman in order to foster some development of those concepts and see where we can apply uh, some good thinking among some very talented people who are doing work in that space. And there'll be some announcements coming out of that. So I'm involved with the community now in, in, an, in a couple of different ways. Firstly, because I'm a member. Uh, secondly, because I'm part of this specific working group. And uh, thirdly, because I do sometimes go and speak at conferences at the invitation of the foundation. For example, when I went to Greece and did the Disrupt conference, that was at the invitation of the Bitcoin Foundation. And so for that purpose, I think it serves its its goals well. But, you know, I, I draw a very bright line between, you know, the working group and the membership and uh, the leadership issues. Uh, I've been asked to join the board. I've been nominated for the board and I have absolutely not, no interest in getting involved in that layer of uh, management or leadership in the foundation, primarily because I think, you know, some of the existing people and structure of that board, as well as the bylaws that, uh, that determine the rules by which that board works are broken, very broken. And so I'm, I'm focused on working in the parts of the foundation that actually work well. Anyway, so that's uh, that's my contribution to foundation. So I, I've got mixed feelings, but I'm trying to keep my work focused on the places where I think I can have an impact and stay away from the places that I think are slightly toxic. I think that name is excellent, though. Committee for the Other Six Billion. That's perfect. Yeah. I mean, what exactly are you hoping to accomplish? Do you think that some organizations will come out of the working group that will actually address these issues like micro lending institutions or I mean, what do you see happening from this? Well, that's still uh, up for discussion. And uh, part of my job is to get the right uh, people, I think people who are committed and active in that space to sit down and talk about these things. 
Uh, so I'm working with some of the well-known charities in the space and, and some of the people who are working on issues such as remittances and micro lending and things like that, things I think will have an impact. And we're trying to discuss what exactly can this working group do. But uh, I can tell you the one thing that has become very apparent is that our focus will be on decentralized solutions. So we're not looking to find some big wealthy NGO and you know persuade them to jump on board with Bitcoin. That's a centralized approach. Uh, we're looking for decentralized solutions. And, you know, perhaps at first, all that means is uh, putting together some reading materials that describe uh, scenarios or use cases where Bitcoin can be used and, and say, you know, this is how you would use Bitcoin in a, in a remittances scenario. This is how Bitcoin could help in a micro lending scenario. I, I think at first, just informational content uh, would be a great first goal. And then we'll take it from there uh, with the emphasis always, always on decentralized solutions to this problem. So one of the interesting things about the foundation, though, that I've kind of noticed is that it seems like a lot of their problems kind of resolve or revolve around the fact that they are kind of centralized and that because of that, the foundation and specifically the leadership that you're talking about can be a bottleneck for actually doing any good work. I mean, I think the reason why why the foundation is oh, yeah. important right now is because they have a bunch of money, right? No, it was foundationally compromised from the very foundation by being centralized right. in a decentralized currency. It's the structure, the bylaws, um, it is a, a, a poorly structured hierarchical organizations with stifling rules designed for a pre-decentralized era, which has, it's almost antithetical to the very essence of Bitcoin, the way it's organized. It completely sucks. But, you know, I mean, the, the problem is that it still is there and we have to deal with it. So um, I'm hoping that we can see some changes in leadership. And I, I hope those changes in leadership can can go in and, and radically modify the bylaws and, and make it a much more open, much more decentralized, much more member focused, much more global organization or simply um, remove remove a lot of its activities and, and allow it to act more as an umbrella for regional organizations in a much more decentralized fashion. E- either way. You know, it's going to need some radical changes. Otherwise, quite simply, it's going to be pushed into irrelevance and oblivion as other more effective, more decentralized, more scalable, more active organizations take root and start producing outputs and producing value. I think you're going to start seeing that with some of the other, you know, the Bitcoin Global Alliance and the various associations that are popping up. Those are in direct response to a need that's not being met and to problems that exist in the existing system. You know, I think that that's a really interesting point, and it's one that I've been very happy to make about Mt. Gox a number of times, really at any available opportunity, is that this thing that, you know, has companies fail or has, you know, again, talking about Mt. Gox, has companies fail, uh, sometimes repeatedly. Um, and in the case of the foundation, you know, because, again, they have these kind of core issues that were set up at the beginning, each of these projects has catalyzed its own eventual competition and, you know, there's always an opportunity to right the ship. There's always an opportunity to, you know, to, to change things. But once you've spurred competition, the competition doesn't stop just because you fix stuff. And so it's an interesting, yeah. I mean, like, it's the, the situation that we have now, like Anthony was saying, you know, really is directly because the foundation had these kind of obvious flaws that became more obvious as time went on. But people figured it out and then started working on solutions. It's very interesting to me. Yeah, it's a little grain of sand that starts the crystallization of the competition around it. But, you know, I love the fact that you pointed out the the comparison to Gox. I would say the foundation is the empty Gox of professional associations in Bitcoin. Um, Its (laughs) its problems go uh, directly back to complete failure of leadership, uh, completely closed, insular, arrogance, uh, sheltered, uncommunicative leadership, part of which was Carpellis himself. But, you know, there's another couple of relics left on that board and uh, they pursue the exact same approach with their leadership. And uh, yeah, the foundation is the gox of uh, of uh, foundations. And, you know, I, in fact, I, I'm surprised they didn't blow up in the wake of the of the Gox scandal, because there was there were a lot of uh, significant conflicts within that environment. Uh, unfortunately, the problem is that the, the very people who are at the heart of this problem uh, have the least amount of awareness and are not about to resign 
and walk off and allow the foundation to become a more effective organization and to revise its rules and to reform itself. That's not going to happen from the inside out. That's going to require pressure. I'm actually a big fan of getting many of the industrial members, uh, sorry, industry members <laughs> of the foundation, um, you know, to start tugging at the strings because uh, they, they can do that. They have the power to do that uh, and to say, look, enough is enough. Um, step down, reform, fix yourself. So we're just going to take our stuff elsewhere. Um, you know, the foundation without its uh, industry members is, is just uh, the individual members and they've ignored them for a couple of years quite effectively. So they'd walk very happily. So I guess this brings up the kind of age old philosophical question of working within the system versus, you know, just going outside the system or starting something new. Both. Mm -hmm. As many as possible. Yeah. I mean, I know that the foundation has funding, right? And they've got a certain amount of name recognition and so forth. So there's, you know, there's going to be an advantage to kind of working with them there. But it sounds like you don't think that they are irreversibly broken, Andreas. It sounds like you think they can be reformed and can get on a better track. Is that right? I, I think there is a possibility. And I also think that in the meantime, they do provide a vehicle for promoting the things I care about, like the, the working group for the other six billion, um, just because of sheer inertia. Um, however, Stephanie, I would say, you know, one of the things that's interesting is you said they're funded. Um, and they certainly have received many funds. Where are those funds? Who that's controls good, those funds? Yeah, that's when will they point. last audited? Are they actually solvent or have all of those funds disappeared into a big black hole? Um, just remember who uh, was in the leadership until recently, uh, mm. who is in the leadership today and what their track record with ethics has been. And I would suggest that... Uh, I wouldn't be not surprised at all if the foundation implodes in a giant embezzlement um, problem sometime down the line or funds get stolen within quotes or without quotes and something like that. I mean, it's 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 bound to happen because these things don't happen because of technical failures. They don't happen because uh, bad actors. They happen because of failures of leadership. And the foundation is is the very definition of a failure of leadership. And therefore, these things will happen to them eventually. Uh, it's just a matter of time. Uh, I think that's one of the reforms we need to see. And, you know, if that doesn't happen, um, you're, you're going to see it blow up probably. You're not worried about being associated with that if that if a blow up does happen? Well, again, you know, I'm keeping my uh, involvement to a very, very specific thing. I'm a mm -hmm. member and I'm on a working group, an unpaid volunteer working group that's composed of people who are not even members of the foundation necessarily and uh, receives no funding and, ha and sends no funding to the foundation. So the only thing we have is the organizing name. And I've purposely kept my involvement to that despite multiple requests to join the, the foundation to become a, you know, to be nominated for various positions. I'm not interested. And part of the reason I'm not interested is because I don't trust the structure um, that it has today or the leadership to be able to deliver ethical leadership and predictable results. I fear that there will be a crisis. So yeah, I'm trying to keep a I'm trying to use the foundation as much as I can to promote the things that are important to me. Um, and then beyond that, um, I'm keeping arm's length. Yeah. And I'm in the same position. I've been approached as well to be doing more, doing work with the foundation, but, uh, I, 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 I decided not to, I think a lot, many of the same reasons, but maybe being on a, on a committee or on a group, uh, might, might make more sense. So, I think I think that's something for me to think about too, Andres. Yeah, exactly. It provides kind of a bit. And keep in mind, there are a lot of. Uh, I think there are a lot of people uh, within the foundation who work in the foundation, um, who are uh, ethical, responsible, hardworking, principled people. The problem is that when you work for an organization that's rotten from the top, um, you know they get chewed up. They're going to get tainted. Um, by this association, even though they're not at, at fault already. I mean, we saw that. I think probably, you know, um, Matonis 
who came in as a breath of fresh air a while ago has now been uh, effectively tainted by the latest uh, scandals. And people are, are, were calling for his resignation, even though Matonis had been the answer in the past to the leadership problems um, and had provided, you know, some reform and, and you know, fresh approaches. Uh, that's that's going to continue happening because until you fix the real problem, it's just going to start tainting everybody else who comes into contact with it. So you have to be very careful how much you get involved. Okay. <laughs> By next week, I'll probably be fired from the working group. Well, I was going to say, I mean, like, Andreas, do you want to just go I, I ahead and insult Peter's there. mother or something? <laughs> Yeah. Wow. I was really trying to choose my words carefully. Uh, you know, again, I, <laughs> that's, honestly, that's I think what people like about it. Show, though. You've heard the show before, right? Yeah, no, and, <laughs> no, well, I and for sure, I, I that's have, actually I probably have. the best thing to do, Andreas, in this situation, because you are affiliating yourself. Stephanie is totally right. And you, again, I think articulating this stuff at the beginning, it's not going to endear you to them, but they're not inviting you because you have endeared yourself to them. They are inviting mm-hmm. you because you have legitimacy that they desperately need, just as Matonis had a ton of legitimacy and had that basically all leached away from him just through this association. So no, I, I think that again, you know, like I, I also, I, I was still, kind of I concerned. still respect John and I, I still respect John. Yeah, and I, I still respect John too. I, a great great exactly. job. But, but unfortunately, yeah, he got, he got, uh, he got splashed by the effluent. I think that that's uh, very appropriate for you to, for you to be very clear about what type of role you're taking there, because at this point it has become kind of a toxic organization. I say as a member of that organization. But um, let's make it clear. It's not just about individuals. The, the problem with the foundation is not just about individuals, although there are some very problematic situations with some of the individuals. The problem is the, the structure itself, the rules and bylaws of the foundation are broken and they will create concentrations of power and hierarchical uh, stress points in the foundation that both attract and reward bad behavior and then uh, ossify that bad behavior so that it can't be excised by the members. The members in the foundation have no power. The founding members of the foundation have more power than the board. And as a result, it creates tremendously unbalanced, non-responsive, non-representative organization that is far too concentrated and hierarchical it's it's as if you try you say here's a decentralized currency what's the worst most unresponsive most hierarchical most concentrated power structure we could put on top of it oh great let's do that (laughs) okay so why don't we do it better i mean like again i know everybody has like a billion projects but the foundation last time i checked had 1200 or 1300 members you know we have orders of magnitude beyond that and 80 percent of our listeners are based in the u.s so if there's no U.S. competition, I mean, like, again, it just seems like you're you're throwing time behind this anyways. I did, you know, six months ago, and then I kind of felt like my efforts with the foundation weren't really, you know, just didn't feel like anything was being accomplished. So I'm just like, anyways, we're clearly, this is way off topic for the show, but it just seems like this is such an obvious explosion that's coming, you know, such an obvious problem <laughs> that appears to be unavoidable no matter what we do, because it's just built into the rules that this thing's going to blow up. Yeah, we're going to get goxed by the foundation eventually if we don't fix it first. And uh, that's going to be unfortunate for for Bitcoin. Um, And I'm really hopeful that other organizations that have started evolving uh, will put pressure on this. But, you know, honestly, I think the only the only recourse at the moment in this particular organization, read the bylaws and and the, the way to the way to address issues in an organization is to learn the rules better than the people who supposedly run by the rules inside the organization and then beat them over the head with the bylaws. I, I think that's a very effective trick. Um, read the bylaws. Um, effectively, at this point, the only group that has any power are the industry members. Well, with that in mind, I think that we're going to wrap this episode of Let's Talk Bitcoin. Thanks to Andreas, Stephanie, and uh, Anthony for being on today, guys. This was a lot of fun and a very interesting, meandering conversation that we had here. I really enjoyed that. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I think this is important to talk about. I don't d- disagree that it's off topic. <laughs> I think it's very important. <laughs> I didn't say it was off topic, just meandering. Um, yeah. <laughs> as we do. All right, I'm going to go take take off my snow boots and brush my teeth because uh, my mouth tastes of snow boot right now. See you guys in three weeks or, or sooner if anybody's going to Coin Summit. Yes, I'll see you in Coin awesome. Summit. Yeah, I'll see you in sure. Coin awesome. Summit too. Thanks for listening to episode 95 of Let's Talk Bitcoin. 
Content for today's episode was produced and edited by Adam B. Levine and Denise Levine and featured Andreas M. Antonopoulos, Stephanie Murphy, Anthony Diorio, and Adam B. Levine. Music for this episode was provided by Jared Rubens and General Fuzz. Any questions or comments? Email adam at letstalkbitcoin.com. Have a good one.